Get Started button, and that will bring you into our introduction notebook, which will give you a little ride through building your first agent. And these are things that there are members that want to go through it. We're going through them at the, at, at the start. We've also, and I've only done the first three months of labs, started organizing the labs that we did over this past year. The different notebooks, just in this case, screenless streaming, so on and so forth, into ways that you can explore down there, and basically learning that open with us over time. So I jumped ahead, and I didn't finish all of 2024 inside of there, because I wanted to write some fun code around it. And you'll see that if you can get, go into docs here, and then October 2024, you'll see all of our meeting notes. Now, if you want to log on to our sessions interface, which I have open here, bless you. If you want to click on this meeting link, this will give you the, you'll be able to see everything that's presented. You'll get a transcript of everything that's been, been told. There's a Q&A and chat interface if you are online, if you're sitting here and you want to pop up a question. But also you'll be able to review, as long as you click on it and during the event, you'll be able to, um, and it doesn't require you know your password, you'll be able to recruit, review any of the videos that you saw. Um, we're getting better about publishing up to YouTube and stuff like that, but you know, we're learning. Let me see, so our agenda today, um, we just had a mixer, so it's great to see everyone mixing and enjoying the space. At the same time, and I don't think we had any requests to do it, we, we did have the opportunity to have a parallel one-on-one -on -one session, but we had some great conversations with people knew. We are going to have a couple showcases. We're going to have a email categorization showcase and summarization by Jackson and Cameron, and they're gonna come up right after I finish introducing. Uh, we're then going to have Sorob said he's going to shout in at 8 to go through a uh, perplexity clone. So actually the perplexity search engine. Uh, he went ahead and cloned that inside a notebook that you can use yourself. And he has a series of, series of notebooks where he's been exploring these concepts. Hopefully you can learn uh, from that. And then last but not least, we have a panel uh, that we're going to put up here about people sharing their experiences around AI software development. So there's been a lot of Cursor, a lot of Claude, Claude Dev, a lot of, and actually I spent a good amount of time with Claude Dev making this uh, over the past, you know, the past week or so, as well as some other sites. Um, so we're going to have some discussions around that. We're going we're gonna to come in, and then we're going to say goodbye. Okay, um, on that case, what I didn't put in here was my normal, my, my, my normal thing. So let's go through this, because we're always a work in progress here, this is probably from last one. But, uh, I do want to go ahead and uh, thank our supporters. Uh, so first and foremost, ACC and the government for Civic and uh, Civic Service. They are sponsoring the venue, uh, which is really great. Uh, I want to thank the Light Chain team. They are sponsoring our food and drinks. So if you're drinking something, if you have some food in your stomach, you know, ping Harrison Chase on Twitter and tell them thank you. If not, uh, at least some any expense that so his company can pay for that. Um, I want to thank Always Cool Brands, uh, what I work for for contributing to our session platform, allows us to grab recordings, uh, allows us to collaborate. Uh, but most importantly, I want to uh, thank every single one of you, which are our community, our contributors, they do code, we're collaborating together. Okay, so I do call out. So we do showcases here every month, and if you want to showcase, pop on our Discord and say, right? Yeah, this isn't about having the most perfect thing to show. You know, we have two, two rules here, very, very simple. Our first rule is be cool. What this means, when someone's standing on, standing on stage, when someone's sharing with you the work that they're doing, we're all in incredibly vulnerable states. We may look like big, tough guys and girls, but we're just kindergartners, right? We're all emotionally vulnerable. And creating that safe space where we know that we can get constructive feedback, that we can get support from the community, that no matter if you are a rock star or if you're kicking rocks, that you, you can be welcome and that you can learn safely, it's a good thing to have. So that's, that's rule one, be cool, right? The second one is don't be gross. We don't mean gross to do it. And if, we have, if anyone has any problems, we haven't had problems, just come talk to me and we're talking to the core members and we'll address it. That being said, uh, we do want to provide a uh, platform for everyone to show off your work. So if you're doing something, if you're exploring something, if you're learning something, and you want to put that out there, and you want to get feedback, please submit to our Discord. Just pop in the Discord and you can DM me directly if you don't want to have a public conversation or whatever. Okay. Next, uh, give you a little bit of update on video production. As you can see, we have cameras now, we have uh, it's, honestly, it's like the endless challenge of producing for YouTube. Uh, luckily, we have, we've been making, making ground, so we've been making movements into this. Uh, our main focus is keeping everyone connected, but uh, if you are interested in the space, there is always work to be done, and I'll leave that at that. And on that, we'll actually go back into our page here, and our NY, there we go. Okay, I want to kick this off and introduce Jackson and Cameron. 
Jackson is looking at his laptop preparing for his talk. So Jackson, Cameron, and two of our members here, and they've been exploring different concepts here in, at Awesome Lane Chain. So, so attachments, 
There's a lot of stuff like chains and threads. How do I tie emails together and make sure that they relate back to one another? Obviously, if you have one email and you don't have the context of the previous email, that's not something we've been able to work through just yet, but these are the types of things that kind of think through as you go forward and try to build off of what we've already done. Yeah. Even things that are very uh, organized and meant to be there, like legal disclaimers, email signatures, that creates a big mess when you're, when you're trying to use your data in this fashion. So there are a lot of challenges, uh, even you know, like handling dates and, and converting dates. There, it's much more than I thought it was. In fact, I think it's probably the hardest, one of the hardest data sets to work with. So I, I always like to, I guess, torture myself and just start with the hardest thing. And then the high volume part of it is something that I think sparked Cam's interest because he working on it a lot. It's not like he's on very cool fire hose. So just a good way to like organize things, be able to pull relevant data out of it that's coming in at a high volume. Project challenges, I mean, there weren't a ton, but it was mainly just this workflow of just two people whenever they could. Hey, what did you do last weekend when I was away or and stuff like that? But um, trying to iterate on this, especially when we, we did start in Jupyter Notebooks, collaborating on that was kind of a pain. Found our way around it. A lot of copy paste is what it ended up. The data sets, work, email was kind of a gray area. So trying to figure out what we wanted to use as a data set, he got it to work pretty well with the Enron email data set, which is when you kind of read through some of the emails, vastly different from the way we communicate over email now. I don't think they realize that that could be pulled out the the way it was. So like when you kind of read through that, it was interesting. And then some of the prompt engineering and stuff like that. Do you want to add? Yeah, and actually, we what we'll see today, we didn't go too far into the prompt engineering. There's a lot of room for uh, taking it to that next level. So it's very based on. And some of the things that I've started throwing in, at least I think the observability and being able to evaluate it very, in some cases, difficult, and uh, built some little utilities that at least help you. Probably the biggest challenge for on this is uh, thank you to Jackson for rolling with it because going a little bit cowboy, well, pretty much the whole time up to this. We got it. We're hacking it together one way or another. So the um, Jupyter notebook thing was a learning curve for me. That was where he was comfortable, and then we flipped it back to scripts, which felt like it was more what I was used to and more comfortable with. And like an inevitable place to like have to go with it on his end of things. But um, some of the models and tools we use, that we basically ran everything locally. Started using Llama 3.2 here over the last week or so. Um, Nomic Embed for embeddings. He actually added all the ChromaDB, MongoDB, Neo4j. Um, ChromaDB obviously is way more out of the box than the other two. But um, that was really where you got it. And I think anyone I've talked about this, though, why don't you start with ChromaDB? I saw it in a couple places and just rolled with it. Yeah, let's go. Probably all of us. I, I have to be very intentional about blocking things out, at least for the time being. I can't get distracted. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to pick something and go with it. Um, then the local aspect of it, we were working with our work email a decent amount. So, like, you know, didn't want to send that over the wire, didn't want it to land maybe somewhere where it shouldn't or get trained over, have a coworker send yeah. a prompt or something, and they're like, hey, my name's in here. I, I, and I think as far as the security and privacy, uh, that's a even on the first slide, I had something, uh, I won't go into it, but that's a whole other discussion. And anyone who's into the uh, security privacy aspect of this, I'd love to I'd love to chat. Running this all on your locally on your laptop, of course there, there are better ways, but I think what's pretty amazing is you can disconnect your NIC, your internet completely, and still still have access to these tools. Yeah, I'm gonna jump into the notebook that I've already uploaded. We can kind of show because there's a couple steps here. But yeah, it's in uh, the browser, the white. Yeah, yeah, there. Nice. But this is mine here? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so I'm not going to get too in depth, I'm just kind of give an overview. And then some of the stuff that we've done, I say we mainly can over the last week, has changed quite a bit. But this is kind of, I mean, some of the same concepts and stuff are, are there. I'm using a lot of the same tool stuff. So uh, this 132 client, this is something that I think is really relevant to bring up because we're accessing the emails directly that's on your computer. So instead of going in, and we talked, I think, earlier about why don't we maybe use like Microsoft Graph API or, or some other access for SMTP. And just this seemed like the most direct way, the safest way, without having to like get into some ethically gray areas with, with work data or anything like that, and run everything locally. Um, so this right here is just to basically list your folders out, get access to all of your Outlook folders and their IDs. 
in Outlook. And that's just to basically go ahead and set up any config files that you have. I do have an ENV file, like example, so if you did want to run this yourself, you could go through and piece that together. You know, say you have afterwards and you want to do that. And we were passing around a lot of config variables between ourselves, so like just back and forth, this seemed like the easiest way to set all that up. Just copy and paste the config class in here. Um, define all our models up front. Schema for structured output, so this is a high model for the structured output that I was using is basically both the classification chain, which was what was feeding. It ended up working out with summaries because we were able to break things down into smaller, more relevant chunks. And then it also helped with the categorization. So I ended up using this, I'll show that in a second, for a way to move email around our actual outlook and you know, based on the category that came up with. And that brain helped me a little bit with pieces of this. And I also noticed an interesting point here. Some of the, if, if you add to this, this dynamic model and get more structured output out of it, I don't know this way to put it basically, but like, it can add context further down the chain. So if you can find a little more relevant chunks out of that, it can aid you later in the process. This is a long method or our option to pull out emails from our Outlook client. And this is... Yeah. So you'll see the attributes that we used right there. And that's actually super, super simplified from what's available. You know, we're talking about like conversation IDs and being able to keep track of entire threads. This is really pretty stripped down, but there are a ton of options there. This is basically just defining, yeah. so define scheme for structure output, classification chain. So it's been a second so this one. Yeah, so this is actually what's moving the emails to different folders, mapping it to big categories of folders, generating the embeddings. I had something here specifically to strip out URLs just to get certain things to fit in context windows and stuff like that. And then actually generate summaries, classify them, and move them to the appropriate folders. So this is a lot of the meat of it. Um, I built it off of, it was basically us cobbling this thing together, um, this function. So there's already some stuff here for generating the embeddings, and then I added some pieces for generating some summaries, summarization steps. And then finally, going into, this is just what executes it at the end. And then this is basically the, the prompts and everything to define like a data summary. So I had two separate scripts, basically, you know, one, and it was built off of everything that Cam did, and just stapled it in here, and he ran with it um, with some of the GUI interface stuff that he did. But, these prompts are just generating a summary, it's a basic summarization chain, and then finally it will go through each category that you already defined, and then generate summaries for each category. So, uh, I'll show that here in a second, and write it to a markdown file, which I believe should be right here. So I redacted a bunch of stuff from this, but this is some things that I received like sometime last week. Um, so you'll see like some, you know, I have Azure DevOps as one of my categories. So it's going through, basically listing out action items off of these as well, giving you summaries for each email. Um, gives you a full summary based off of all of those items that are listed. Uh, my company's out of South Carolina, so some of it is related to an update section. And the update section is a lot of stuff related to the hurricane that just passed through. And so people provide help or like different things related to uh, workflow in context of that. So, and then the other big one is the marketing and spam stuff. So I just wanted to be able to pull those out, ideally anyway. I think you, we've both been able to spot certain things we, we had missed just looking at our inbox, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Even seeing things worded in a different way for me. Like, oh yeah, I, I should pay attention to that. <laughs> right, yeah, now, there, there's random stuff that comes up now when I look at it, and I probably should answer that. But, but yeah, I mean, this is just a basic summary, not to go too in depth with it, but you can see it's pulling out status reports, it's pulling out meeting requests. So. So there's so much you can do with that. I mean, whether it's drafting a response to the emails, mess with that a little bit. I think, like I said, once you have the data process and structured into these vector data stores and databases, it's pretty almost what you can do with it. So now I'll just kick it over. We'll look at the script or the IDE version that we have here. So like Jack said, I threw in some GUI components, and really this could be a Claude Dev demo, <laughs> because I did all of the GUI with Claude Dev. So I describe things or take screenshots and then point out where I wanted these changes. I referenced the script that it used to turn on the back end, and it's uh, done it's absolutely blown away. <laughs> so if you haven't checked that out yet, definitely do. Yeah, one, one cool thing that he did yesterday, he showed me, he took a screenshot of this, opened up a whole separate window, told it to generate the same UI, and then gave it 
script that's actually you know, functioning in the background with this GUI interface, and then said basically tie all these components together and just work based on the same as this. One, yeah, one prompt and it's functioning. Yeah. Okay, so this is built uh, interface components. This is Q, I guess. Will inform you of that. <laughs> QT. I, I, QT. I didn't select it. Actually, Claude Dev did. So I have some of this data. This is already staged, so I will just click through this, and then if we have time or you guys want to, we can run it. Um, I'm pretty confident it runs. It runs well. Do the demo. Yeah, we will. I'll click through these screens first. So ideally, you know, you, can even, you don't even need a GUI, depending on what you're trying to do. For this summarization, you would really just set this up as a scheduled task, and it would be in your inbox or in your Obsidian or wherever. This is helpful for demonstration, though. So we have it set up to select your date range. This is the These are the dates of the emails you want to process and embed. And then we have this step that does the categorization. So this will go through the same process Jackson talks through, and then it will embed the categories into ChromaDB. So, and I, I didn't realize this until today because I use a desktop, and when I busted out my laptop, there's major resolution problems, so I apologize. And you probably can't even see it, but the categories are embedded in Chroma. So, very helpful for additional context. And one of the questions I still don't know the answer to is once we, if you do the categories first, and then you do the summarization, does it, is there any, does it make any difference if the summary includes the categories or not? And that's actually, some of these I've kind of set up so that you can run basically in loops, export the results, and then be able to compare them really quickly. Yeah, so this is the summarize step. Uh, there's some drop downs we have built in here so you can use the different, you can choose which model you want to use. Of course, this has been heavily centered around local llama, so that's all you see here. And then once the summaries are embedded, just like the summaries are embedded into ChromaDB, just like the categories, then you run this uh, map, cloud summaries map reduce methodology, and that's what creates the uh, that overall summary. And I'll show you, like Jack said, I was using the, I flipped over to the Enron data set. Earlier today I ran it for a whole year, at least from Sally Beck's one year of emails, and this is what it came out with. And you can define these categories. You know, his is a little bit different. This is by date, and then category and subcategory. And you know, I'm not Sally, so it looks pretty good to me, but I can tell you <laughs> when I used my actual email data, I was like, wow, yeah, this is actually really super helpful. So I'm not gonna take you through that entire thing. So the, this latest step, I mean, past the GUI, when we were talking, it, it's like even testing, you have to go in and delete the data every time you run it, you know, run the process and then delete a lot of back and forth. So integrated MongoDB to keep track of the jobs so that when you rerun it for this, if it's already run that date range, it will just skip those emails, say, hey, we already took care of that, and we're just gonna pick up the delta. So, uh, in a real, if you're really using this, I think that'd be super, super helpful. And then that took me down to into uh, exploring Neo 4J, and that's where my excitement really exploded. And I haven't done a ton with it in this, but I do have something that can kind of help illustrate. There's a retriever, and this is actually a Langchain Neo 4J adapter, text to cipher, and sorry, you can't see it, but you do like top people, and you can ask real questions like, what was, who are the top senders for Sally or whatever. So this error because, as you can see, I have set up drop downs for, to compare OpenAI versus Alama versus Grok, so you can run the same query and see which one actually works. And this has actually been super fun. Several times about myself just like playing with this and then like, oh yeah, I actually have things, other things I should, should be doing. Um, you know, as far as the utility functions, little stuff like this is helpful. There's a show schema and you can see the schema of the uh, graph database. Um,
and then there's a visualization. Well, I'll just I'll just show some of these that I already did. That's not it. So like I said, the using just the person, the email, and the subject is pretty limited, and this is what it came up with as far as creating those relationships. But the more data that you have in there, or if you have other data sources, I I think, and this is where I hope I'd love to hear more uh, people who know more than I do. But I think with the graph, that's where you can really create the additional context and really, really tie things together when you're dealing with mass amounts of data. So I'm, I'm very excited about this part. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that pretty much sums it up. I mean, there's tons of little things that we could talk about, but uh, I'm more interested in questions. So I'll come off with a couple of questions here uh, as I'm multitasking. My apologies to everyone who's trying to log in our sessions interface. Apparently, it is big with us. So um, you mentioned that you hadn't looked at some of these technologies day one starting these. So can you describe a little bit about your journey from, hey, I'm going to do, I'm going to approach a business problem. I categorize my emails. I'm going to provide some sort of clarity into the stream of crap coming in the mailbox, right? To ha having uh, to encountering. Some of the some of the tools that you showed us along the way, because you mentioned that they weren't really on your radar before. Can you describe a little bit about that and the insights that you were able to get? Well, I, like I said, I, I somehow came across LangChain. I don't even remember how. It was probably in the same search that I was like, how do you download Python? And it's it's really just for me been like, what are the different technologies that I hear the most about as I'm reading through these demos or these other articles. There's not been a lot of R&D. It's really, for me, it's just like, choose something and go with it. So I don't know if that, if that answers your question. Uh, I, don't, I don't, there's no methodology for me. I'm just really winging it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I think a lot of it was just, hey, can we solve something here? Is there, I, I think in my last presentation I gave, I said one of the things that I come on is tool selection and maybe you're thinking certain tools or try, hey, I want to try something new here. That extends the amount of time I gotta spend to try and figure this whole thing out and figure out if two days of value that I'm actually trying to build here. So instead of trying to get from point A to point B by reinventing the wheel eight different ways so I know how to do it one, and I think that there's a lot of obvious options that we just kind of throw the TV. So audience there is microphones all about and hidden around here. Yeah, it's like over at the car. Can it categorize your emails, like delete the ones that you don't need? Because like, well, basically organization-wise, can it organize your emails towards where it doesn't delete the important ones? Yeah, so that was one of the things. I didn't want to give it keys to delete anything, especially when I was just testing through stuff. But you can move it around through your Outlook using the same function. So I basically wanted to find the junk emails and say, let me read through those and make sure they're junk first, and then delete those. But you could theoretically let it delete your emails. So and I, on my laptop, I can show like four or five folders I have set up with all the emails, and it's, and it's pretty pretty accurate. Yeah. Well, that Gmail one, so we're kind of on the side. There's a simpler version of this that ties, uses the Gmail API. And that one was set up. It will run and then send, send an email. And you could, we're using this Pi Win32. You can do anything. It's not limited to Outlook. It's Microsoft platform across the board. So I've set it up. Yeah, you could have it draft a response to the email and actually send it if you wanted to. I mean, that's. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Wouldn't it be pretty easy to transfer that over to using whatever the, the cloud equivalent is, the graph API? Yeah, the, the Gmail version, it's the same. Everything is the same except your data source. Like you're grabbing it from the API, and then you I process it the same way through the same, you know. I can see there being some differences in the structure of the data maybe that you have to account for, but I'm, we're not doing a ton in terms of like structuring data now. Like we're, we're taking a lot of the raw email data and just popping it in there. And there's some stuff that we've picked out, and there's definitely more that we could include, but. Yeah, that's a good point. And my workflow has been like, okay, here are the attributes from Outlook, and I'm talking to uh, OpenAI. Or <laughs> these are the attributes from Outlook. Convert these to, um, you know, there was one for Mac Mail. I tried to uh, the native client on Mac. And it just, you know, 
switches them out and you're good to go. And the way, like I said, for me it's like trying to get to that, this modular approach of, okay, your data loader is different, everything else past that is pretty much the same. You just, I think this one works today. So you said it can draft responses too, right? So depending on, so like say for instance, I get an email for right? And I want to, because I use ChatGPT to basically program replies. Can I use this to just type in a quick reply and fix it up and then send it? So I can. I mean, really, it's once you understand the APIs and services you're trying to look into, or in this case, it's the Win32 com client that we're basically accessing. I mean, you should be able to plug it in any spot. So yeah, I mean, you can just, anything that you can do, you can program. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he can. He, I think, he's very excited about the way it fits into everything. Excel or anything, because you can generate Word documents using the same client and stuff like that. So that was what we were, we were trying to figure out the best way to actually spit out the summary at the end. Was it like, maybe we use the same thing, put in a Word document, kind of land on just crank it out and mark it out and put it in the city. But you could change the workflow however you want. I think that Jupyter notebook would be a de decent starting point. Yeah. Well, I think we're reminded that every person uses email very differently. Yeah, a lot of different use cases and ways that you can customize it. So, right. I have a question. So, very cool presentation. It sounds, or you may have stated this in the beginning, right? I'm going to ask again what's the problem you're trying to solve here? Because when I'm thinking of a similar application, my first, my, my, my approach is that my inertia comes from I can do some of these things already within my Gmail. What I would love to see is because I have conversations in my Outlook, I got conversations in Slack. If I can somehow start merging those two so that I can then to build a story. That's something that I would That's exactly what how I'm thinking about it, right? And whereas I, I think I'm very excited about the graph, they basically able to tie everything together. And, you know, like we said, this is not a necessarily something that solves a problem. I mean, it does and it doesn't. I mean, Copilot, Microsoft Copilot, yes. It has all these capabilities above and beyond that. For me, it's more like how do you how do you build that brain, your brain, your digital brain, and especially when you start talking about the agentic workflows. I mean, if you think, you know, really, I think this type of thing could be like a tool. And so Slack, that would, could be another tool if you have an agent. That's kind of how I, I'm thinking about it. I don't know that that's the right approach. I'm totally winging it and just learning these things as I'm experimenting. Yes. Well, I mean, when we talked for the first time, his pain points were way different than the ones I was thinking of. And it had to do a lot with his workflow, his job and stuff. So he had already been finding ways to look into different areas, uh, whether it's teams or you know, different databases and stuff. That spreadsheets and exchange or anything like that. So he's been trying to figure out how to cobble all of that together. And he's starting to piece things together. This is really just a piece of it that I have. I'll give you an example like having, um, I'll take a call from a customer or a client who is, they have an escalation. Hey, what's going on? Maybe I didn't even realize that was going on yet. So the idea is as soon as I answer the phone, I have right in front of me, here are all the most recent ticket, you know, like tickets, IT tickets they've had. Here's all the notes from those tickets. Here are all the most relevant emails from that person and the other discussions I've had. Like having immediate, quick access to your information is where I'm at. Yeah. Before you hear the emails from Outlook, you wrote the code yourself. Uh, did you try to find a, a tool already that will mine like an online chain like tool? Or was there anything at all? Or? I think what he built, I mean, Com client is close you could get with uh, with directly accessing email from Outlook. And I think we had a conversation earlier about, you know, should we have hooked it directly to the SMTP server or anything like that? That's, that's a pop up, a pop up my question. Okay. What, what you, you did, you could actually wrap that into a uh, Mic Chain tool and then publish that. Is, is there anyone who's tried to do that already for Outlook or other Microsoft tools? Uh, did you like look, look, look that up or? There was actually the competition that Kareem was in. One of the finalists was a Outlook plugin that does something very similar. But he's talking about an actual Outlook tool that like an agent can use or something. I don't. I didn't do any research on that. I'm sure that somebody can be 
has a plugin or something that they use, like LLM tool. But yeah, I don't know if I understand your question, but I was, I've almost thought of this as like, yeah, you can almost have an API that takes care of this particular process. I don't know if that's. Well, did they tell me APIs that, of course, but the, the question was like, in, in like, if you, in like 19 community, you have all sorts of like components that have been provided by the community, and uh, when you use those, they will go get the, the, your API endpoints, whatever, and then you send it back as a, as a Lightning documents, uh, like objects. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're already formatted. And so, uh, what you've actually done, you could wrap that out into a proper like uh, Lightning tool and then funnel shits and have it used by, by the community. Other people will be actually using them directly. It's actually a good idea. Yeah. yeah. But the, every, almost everything in here is uh, our line chain. It's like even the message loader for handling emails and formats it into the document. But he, he's, he's getting, so there's these public access to the in that army, but there's public access to all tools you can get out of And he's basically saying we can do something similar to that. Yeah. So, so what are the questions to have uh, for the presenters today? Okay, well, I, I really want to thank you two for putting this together and for sharing us, uh, sharing with us how you've been able to explore using LangChain and all these other cool tools and interact with your email. Uh, I am eager to see more about your explorations of Cypher, graph databases, uh, writing context to your data, visualizing the data. You know, you both work in spaces that there's a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of additional data that provides context. And uh, I don't know about all of you, but like I, I get stuck in this world where I'm going through a summary of an email chain, trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Uh, and the ability to start to utilize these next generation systems to categorize, and I assume, hearing this, this in both of you talk, that uh, taking action and, and, and next actions out of this are something that in your view for the future? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it looks like Sword's having some cha challenges getting logged on, so we're gonna go ahead and put together our panel on AI software development. Rob, Jackson, and Ryan, can you come to the front and let's grab one of these white chairs up here. In the, the talk today, some notions of AI assistive software development. Um, many of us here have been going down this road for the past few months here at Austin Link Chain. Uh, I'd like to use uh, this space right now to kind of explore how each of you are seeing uh, your software development uh, methodologies change, your viewpoints on um, how AI assisted uh, coding may be changing your world and the Maybe bring it into some automated testing and debugging space, if that is interesting. And then the project management the workflow, maybe we can talk about the futures. Uh, for the start, let's kick it off. Uh, Rob, can you give just a, like, a short brief about what you do, what your focus is, and each of you, what you do, what your focus is, and you know, what is your top of mind about the subject of AI software development? Yeah, cool. So I'm Rob Kessler, I would consider myself sort of a split brain. I'm, I'm half finance, half uh, AI, and basically I'm trying to use AI and all, everything technology to uh, basically reinvent the Wall Street analysts, which is what I've been for a couple decades. So I want to basically admit my replacement before I retire. And so in terms of uh, using AI in the development workflow itself, which is sort of the meta uh, concept, I guess, in some respects, I think of it like a new employee. You know, I've had small teams of developers, and I've always found that uh, the better that I scope a task and explain what needs to be done, the, the quicker I get back a solution that conforms to that expectation. If I'm too fast and too varied in how I have my instructions for what I need from the team or what I'm expecting, then I get back kind of a garbage answer. And I find the same is often true with these elements whatever we're using, whether it's a copilot with Git, GitHub, or whether it's uh, Claude Dev, uh, as long as I am explicit about what I'm, what I'm asking, good, good response is. And um, so in some respects, I think that's transferable, going from the sort of human aspect to the virtual. Jackson, when you give a little background about where you're coming from on this and like initial insights with these AI code tools. Yeah, so like I said earlier, I'm a software engineer, full we'll stack software developer. And I mean, when I feel like when ChatGPT first got launched, it was kind of this like revelation, and you're just like, oh, okay, this can help me probably twice as effectively as any Google search ever could. And that kind of just from there just kept growing on top of itself. Obviously, the tools like GitHub Copilot, I think, was another nice, easy integration. And now Claude Dev is kind of taking that up a notch. 
So for me, it's just about efficiency gains. Uh, and I kind of apply that to my personal life as well. So anywhere I can you know, just get an extra 30 seconds of my day back, I feel like I try to use it for that. Uh, Cloud Dev is a, a good example, even today, where you know, if you're doing something, building something end to end, maybe I just need to tweak a store procedure over here, build out you know, a screen on the other end of things, hey, why don't you just pass this task off over to Claude Dev, let it handle the small, mundane task that it needs to do. But obviously you're seeing it on the other end of the spectrum where you can get from point, you know, get to point A, like you saw what Cam was doing with the GUI interfaces, very quickly. So like, I don't think it's, it's I think it's also going to replace some of the low code solutions. That's the things that we talked about too, where going from drag and drop solutions, being able to replace those with legitimate code and see that code, and then being able to modify it to what you need. So I think there's a lot of possibilities that are endless, and I think it, you know, there's the short term, there's the intermediate term, there's the long term, and I don't feel like I can confidently forecast anything after the end of 2024. So it's kind of long for the ride at this point. I feel it. Brian, what about you? Yeah, so over the past eight years, I've been running an internal application, web-hosted application that enables our sales team, marketing team, non-technical people to, to better demo and, and demonstrate our product to our customers without having to manage it on their local system or anything like that. So we've had a very small group of team, or a small team, there's four of us. One technical lead, the rest are developers. Um, we all wear multiple hats. We should be a team of at least 10 engineers, um, but we're not. And so we've, with that, we've always had to work very efficiently, try out the methodologies, plug and play different styles of doing stuff, be as efficient as we can with all of our, with all of our meetings, our time, things like that, planning. Everybody wears multiple hats, comes in, does, does what needs to be done. And so from a software development standpoint, that's usually where I'm coming from, is as a full stack engineer, having to figure out fix problems across multiple technologies. So that's actually a, a great segue into fixing problems against, uh, across multiple technologies um, and generating across multiple technologies. Uh, I think uh, in an earlier presentation, we, we saw mentioned that, you know, Cloud Dev to, in this case, one AI in the tool, to generate, to hack together an SL front end interface. Where in your experience or in your viewpoint, are you seeing your, uh, your AI, whether it be AI accelerated by the plugin or an external component, um, where are you seeing that fit in your workflow, like expanding the workflow of what you're able to do? For me, two things seem to define the success, if I to summarize it for, for what I've seen. One is the brain, uh, so what it's been trained on, and best I can tell, you know, plot sign at 3.5, the more mainstream the, the code that you're using, the better chance it is it kind of understands without having to feed a whole lot of specificity. So as an example, something like GUI based React, you're a big element, or, or your base library Python, you know, I mean, it's gonna know what you're talking about pretty easy. The further I get into nuanced code or then there's specific implementations of things, the more it's gonna start getting stuck in loops just because it doesn't understand the context. And I'm gonna have to almost pretty much do it myself at the end of the day. And I, I find myself having to check myself on that because sometimes I'll get lazy and I'm like, oh, this is something I don't want to have to look up because it's so, you know, nuanced that I don't care to remember it. I want to rely on this AI to solve that for it. That's exactly the kind of thing I want to use it for, right? And so I just lazily throw it in there and it doesn't work and I try to force it to do it again. And then finally I learn what it's doing and I go through line by line and I'm like, oh, it's stuck in a stupid loop because it really doesn't understand the syntax here. Gotta go to the docs, look it up, the old school way, right? So the brain, right? What does the brain know? What has it been trained on? The other thing that for me defines success is the context. So if you've got a big code repository, first of all, it's good to break it down into modularized smaller files. That's generally in most implementation good for code practice anyway, right? But even then, you might have a, a large code base that's pretty heavily nested in file structures, and with that, I find it's not natively the best at being able to transverse that. Now, a, a colleague of ours, Baskin, has, has uh, taken an initiative in that space and uh, designed a little add-in where you can basically, with every prompt on the back end, give Claude Dev a little bit of understanding of the overall structure of the project, both what you're trying to accomplish and where to find things. 
I think that's a, that's a great sort of added source. Of kudos to Basket for doing that. And then in addition, the native Claude Dev capability, you can do a little at symbol and like specifically reference files. So for today, for example, I knew I had a pretty complicated structure and I, I didn't want it to go off on a tangent and modify a bunch of different files. I knew exactly which four or five files I wanted to work with. They were in different folders. I said, use this file for this context. I want you to consider this, that, and that. And it gets it done in the first file. So a few extra minutes making sure I point out exactly what context I wanted to use, uh, understand where the brain has been trained, and I think for me those are the two key respects. I mean, just back to uh, just where can I get small efficiency gains. So I've been working in larger code bases, like a lot of can get hung up on some things. It's kind of hard to get it to do exactly what you want if you're pretty far along in a project. Some of the business logic is pretty pretty deep. It doesn't do great at handling those things. So I think, and, and, and honestly, I can program that out quicker than I can figure out how to prompt and get it to do the thing I want to do anyways. But then there's certain things where today I had like a where clause that wasn't even that complicated. It was like multi-level, but it was something that more or less I just didn't want to have to think through. So I just let it do that thing and grab a cup of coffee on back here it is. And so there's small things like that. And part of it is this, I think, laziness of having to get super verbose about what it is that I want it to touch, what I want it to do. And, and, and at that point, it's kind of the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean, I might as well just write it at this point. So I do think it's going to get to a point, and maybe it's by the end of the year, maybe it's by the end of next year, but I think it's right there where you don't have to say too much. It's going to be so, so I'll go a little bit different direction. One of the, one of the first more powerful use cases that I've written into um, was more by accident than anything. Uh, me and my team were sitting through doing a planning session for a feature of our next scrum, and we were going back and forth like you normally do on hashing out could be better, right? A Linux um, daemon for the feature we were building, or would, would a script be better to handle what we were doing? There was a lot of back and forth, no clear answers, and my team lead, he gets all the credit on this one, I didn't think of it. He just pulled up ChatGPT. This was this was about a year ago. So he, he pulled up ChatGPT and basically asked, "Hey, how do I write a daemon?" To blah 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 blah, and it spit out a set of code to write a daemon. And he was like, "Okay." Then he turned around and said, "How do I write a script to do the exact same thing?" And it spit out a script. And instantly, everybody in the meeting can all look at the script and all look at the code on the screen and instantly know what's more complex. What are we looking at? What are we facing? And then it accelerated the conversation into, if we go the daemon route, we didn't consider this, 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 and this, but the code pointed it out. We didn't need the code to write anything for us. We didn't need it to work. It was just pseudo code. And it got everybody on the same page instantly. We all came out of that one pretty shocked with what just happened, but then that instantly got integrated into all of our meetings, all of our planning sessions, all of our scrums when we have to sit down and we have to either design something or figure something out, let that do the, the heavy lifting, let it do 80% of the work, spit it out, dump it in the Jira tip and move on, and then we can write on top of that. And it, it accelerated a lot of our planning work by doing that. You know, that's really interesting they bring up the, the acceleration of the AI agent as a, as a third or fourth team member to be able to um, rapidly iterate and visualize on the structure of something might be. Expanding on that, you know, kind of the next step past that is often like automated testing and debugging, right? And, and, and kind of getting that feedback, that feedback loop in that cycle. Let me see, can you, in, in all, all this, start with Brian on this because you've kind of gone over this a little bit, but can you share either some time, some, some, some examples of how, how um, automating that feedback loop and that, that feedback cycle for debugging either within a ID plugin like Claude Dev or external in your code, where you see that adding value in any place that you see value so far? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think when you can have the agents who can actually analyze what type of output you're getting and be able to react to it or turn around and, and make additional steps to correct what's wrong, we, we already see that with, with these with these flows and with these agent interactions. And and so if, if you can have a developer who can actually write the code, it, it can even be an agent. Write the code, write the test, and then have a test agent who actually executes the test and sends feedback back. Um, that can also be done within the PR process. When, when code gets checked in, PR gets pushed for review, you can take and have an AI agent or inside the workflow 
review and say, okay, if, if you were to write this code, what test would you write with it? Kind of double check that it's picking up all the use cases of the code. Is it pinpoint enough for unit test, integration test, end to end test, whatever? And so adding that in there gives them an extra layer of just visibility into are we doing this the right way? But then also going further into allowing the agents and the AI to do that stuff for you. So if one of them can say, yes, you need to do these four things, the next one can actually pick it up and attempt to execute it and make it happen and then provide a feedback loop back and forth through the chain to do that if possible. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I've used it the old school way just for eight years of method go ahead and write like an X unit and unit type of unit test for your for method. But I haven't done anything too extensive when it comes to testing. I, I do think that there's other ways, like you mentioned, um, using it as like a separate team member. We're on some super small teams where I work, so there's sometimes you get not the best requirements, or not the best documentation, whatever it is. So this is another way to continue with that. I think being able to save yourself time through writing mundane unit tests and then also on the back end be able to have it create documentation and stuff like that. I think there's plenty of space all around a project that you could go ahead and you know, build out a fully fleshed team if you don't really have it. Bro? I haven't dealt extensively in using documentation and testing. Part of it's a trust issue and I just need to get over that hurdle. Some of it is depending on the project I'm working on. Some of my internal stuff, documentation is sourced. Uh, and stuff for clients, I'm very focused on the documentation and I don't get to pass that. But that's just Okay, and last round, and we'll definitely open up to the audience. So, let's do the combination. Where do you see, uh, let's explore how AI and AI software development interact with the project management side. Right, so creating tickets, creating PRs, uh, and coming into the existing workflow. And Brian touched on the integration of agents into like, pipelines. Do you see uh, other areas in, in, with your experience, with, with, with your exploration into these AI tools, are you starting to see opportunities for this to fit into kind of the, the non-functional requirements of, of the day-to-day -day developer? I, I was going to say absolutely yes. Kind of the, the first story that I told, um, I think that's a, that's a, a key point. Um, the, everything that happened in the planning was all the PM style function. And so I, I think you, you have this gap between engineering teams and product teams a lot of times it seems like product team is just writing something and throwing it over the fence and saying good luck. But where can they add value? The, the product teams can't necessarily sit down and write a ton of code. So if they can leverage AI and they can leverage, le leverage agents and workflows to build up either like a simple proof of concept or even build out pseudo code that can help showcase for the engineers what they need and make it clearer or even a starting point better than you know, a bullet point and as a as an end user, I want to be able to run, you know, that type of stuff. And so I, I really think it has a lot of value there. And if the PMs can actually get a good starting point started for the engineers, that allows them to move a lot faster and a lot more accurate. Uh, yeah, I think, I, Colin, we talked about Pixar.dev. That was like a good example of that, where sometimes you're forced to just come up with UI <laughs> on your own. And I'm not somebody that's really good at just brainstorming where things should sit on a screen. Uh, so if you leave it to me, it probably doesn't come out the best looking thing, but having a good starting point with something like Dev that gives you UI mock-up at a minimum and some ideas uh, that you can work off of. And then sometimes it's trying to figure out how to architect a solution, figuring out the best way to go about something. It can be small, like, you know, maybe it's a do get package, going back to our .NET conversation earlier. So it's like, well, why don't we use one thing versus another and be able to have something ask questions off of and have more of a conversation versus perusing the Microsoft docs, which probably ends up inevitable at some point or another, but prefer to skirt that if I can. And, and so I think there's plenty of space too around, and I, I think our, my company can in particular do it a lot better, but finding ways to just automate some of these things that, whether it's handling your tickets, building requirements, gathering requirements, documentation, I think all that stuff can be heavily automated in a lot of ways, and, and even doing stuff like what Cam and I are working on, building those types of components into that workflow. So in RFPs, I mean, it, it really goes all the way up the ladder. My friend said over here, we, we were talking about it in the car not too long ago, where if you, this is getting a little, a little ahead of things, but if you walk Claude Dev 10 steps down the road, what does that gonna really look like? And 
you know, if this thing's already coding things out for you, like, where does the developer sit? And it sounded like, you know, you kind of made a joke, like, well, what are you going to be doing? And it's like, well, it might be the other question, where it's like, you have to be just technical enough to know what questions to ask it, where you're going to sit in the middle of things. So there's a lot of workflow things that I think over the next two years are going to really, not really sure where they're going to lead, honestly, but uh, that's kind of at least some inevitable that it's possible. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's huge on the front end. I mean, all the planning stage, uh, concept selection, ideation. Uh, a lot of my projects, I want to take all the stuff that is not really proprietary. I want to use the most mainstream, well-supported uh, solution possible. And what better way to do that than to query the AI that used to offload it and call it dev, right? So if I can ask it some early prototyping questions, and it seems like it pretty quickly mock up a solution that looks very logical, well-supported, not too cumbersome, convoluted. Okay, that might be the same concept to run with. And that's real rapid, a lot, a lot faster than, than I've done in the past with humans, right? Where, okay, all right, who's gonna, for the next you know couple days, you're gonna look into this, you're gonna look into that, let's reconvene and see you know, where we think we wanna head with this. Now it's like a matter of 15 minutes with chat to the and so one of the one of the things I'm kicking around, I, I got ideas about from last month goes into this, and I, I see this this futuristic view. So we saw last month where we could take audio transcripts and we could really pull out key components of it, um, measure what what were key conversations, what were key topics, things like that. So you take that one step further. If if you're looking at building a product or a feature or whatever it is, you're taking take your app in a different direction. You pull all the great minds into one room and everybody starts hashing it out. And the problem is, is we get this very flat, very condensed notes or transcript of the meeting that, that everybody has to take action out of. And what ha actually happens in the meetings is people actually go through architectural walkthroughs. They, they discuss what's happening, they discuss how we build this. And even sometimes it goes further where there's conflict and there's three or four different approaches to take. So if we can take it to the point where we can take the audio transcript translate it and filter it down into a code generation tool, by the time everybody walks out of that meeting and gets back to their desk, there's three AI mock-up tools with all the different discussions happening that shows the different approaches. That can be measurable. You can actually hit, click a button and see output and see what works, what doesn't. And so be able to take what we're talking about and have it actually build it for us while we're going. I think that technology is there now. Now, to shift it straight to production, I don't think so. But if we can get 50% of the way there now, that's way better than we were before. You know, the 50% the 50 of the way there uh, rings true to me, uh, especially in the spirit of learning the open and showing how we're broken stuff to each other. I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience, uh, questions, comments. What questions do you have for the panel? What would you need to see the trust? I don't see whether I distrust it. I still I think, I think what I would need to do is take some stuff that I've delivered to a client, run it through the AI version, and kind of compare, and just make sure. Because I don't want to I don't want to release the reins on something that I haven't fully checked myself, I guess. When I think about what I've delivered to clients, I do a lot of, I mean, I'll test, test it through a couple times. You know? So I document, and then I'm going to walk through the documentation and do a full, full run through at least a couple times. And if I catch one thing, I'm redoing the whole run through and just to double check. And it's sort of a paranoia thing because I don't want, if my client has to waste time on any one thing, he's the guy or gal that didn't build it, it's going to take them way more time than it would be to quickly find that. So it's a, it's a balanced thing. And I guess, you know, as I'm speaking out loud about this, you know, all this sounds like an extended workflow, right? I mean, you can have multiple grading layers and testing layers built into this. So there's no reason it's not possible. Most of my clients, these range from large institutional investors to small businesses with you know, a handful of people trying to, or the owner just wants to say, got workflow, way, way too few hours to work with, and way too much to do. It's like, how can I uh, use an AI to solve this? So I'll like, go into the uh, combination of traditional and, and AI tools, you know, try and make it as automated and hands off as possible, but then have the documentation. So if anything ever, they ever get into it, because it's generally a so when I get asked that question, I came from network automation, network infrastructure automation, and for the past 10 years I've been bombarded with that question. And then falling into the AI space, you know, I hear that question a lot, is when do you trust the AI to do something that you don't review? 
And my response is always thrown back on the person to tell me when they trust their team to be able to do that without me reviewing. And when you can trust your team to deliver something without it having to be fully reviewed by you as a manager or whatever, those should be the exact same workflows and the exact same testing validation steps that an AI takes. I, I don't necessarily think the AI should be treated any different than you would a human team member. At what point do you trust it? And when you can put qualitative numbers to that for both humans and AI, that also allows you to measure who can do it better. But until then, it is a guessing game, and you have to trust, build some trust on it. And it's up to you. That's usually how I answer that one. I was paying fingers to know what kind of idea you use and uh, uh, an integration tool. I, I tend to prefer with iChar and the PHP Storm, but when it comes to using the Copilot, the uh, VS Code integration is much better. And so I end up using, like, going back and forth between two ideas. What kind of idea you use, and has like, the use of uh, AI changed which ID you use or which tools you use with, like, between the, like, the AI and your own? I use Visual Studio Code in Cloud Dev as a nice little added native to that, so it's been a multitude for the last several years on the Except the Cloud Dev thing. Yeah, I was pretty much exclusively VS Code. I would try things out just for fun. And I, I did do, like, any of the JetBrains IDs, so I really liked Rider during, you know, different styles of .NET development, but, and then PyCharm, diving into LangChain and everything else. But now with Claude Dev, like, kind of default VS Code. So yeah, it's definitely changed because of that. And I think JetBrains has their own AI coding system. I don't think it's as good as the other two. I've been a hardcore PyCharm idea user for the better part of a decade. I use it quite in depth. Um, I have found, to answer your question, it, the, the AI movement has shifted me over to give um, VS Code more of a chance to see how it is. Um, I feel, in my opinion, the JetBrain PyCharm has not, it's more clunky to work with, it's not as intuitive, it's not built into the workflows like it should be. And I see that that is better handled by the VS Code team. And then you have tools like Claude Dev that everybody keeps talking about that's VS Code only, that, that makes a big difference there. Um, I do use Copilot, um, the GitHub Copilot, a paid subscription on PyCharm. And I would say half the time I'm developing, um, I have it turned off, um, mostly because of the, the auto completion functionality gets annoying, especially when I'm editing code. But when I'm writing that new code, I let it run loose. Um, so that's kind of my experience with it. Something's kind of interesting though, because you mentioned earlier about, you know, almost want to just use the most popular frameworks and languages and everything, just so it's familiar with those. I, I have started to wonder if we just kind of converge all the same handful of tools, no matter, yeah, we just keep going down the same routes because, you know, why use anything else if this is where all the tools are, this is where all the people are, this is what the AI is the best. Yeah, I think there's some stats around how the, uh, the human-generated, you know, content debugging and stuff online has dropped off since Gen AI, so it's sort of a reinforcement. You might have Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. I was thinking about the problem I think, Jackson, that you were saying about having to be super verbose. Or maybe you were talking about as well, Rob, but when you're extra explicit, it should lead to better outcomes. Uh, I definitely went through this experience, I think Colin and I were talking about it last week, where I wanted to get it right on the first prompt, so I took extra time. I actually said, listen, I have a problem. This is like the first thing I wrote in the, the context. It's like, I have this issue. Do not start coding it. Right? So here, let me describe it first. And then ended it with, do you understand so far? And I think I was working with Claude to the chat. So my question is, are there tactics like, you know, don't start until I say so. Here's four different prompts with four different file attachments so you get the full story before you click go to get, to increase your chances of getting that like first prompt response to be perfect. Um, and then sort of tacked onto that idea or question is, has anyone experienced, like, instead of having to explain all the things that might need to know, saying, ask me what you think you need to know, because maybe that might be less verbose, where you can just be like, yep, no, yep, mm, you decide, okay, now go. Um, I know that wasn't a question as much as my idea, so I guess that it's how do you, it's probably an engineering question, I suppose. Myself, I found the best success by breaking that up 
uh, I'm not attempting to get it right the first first time. So when, when I'm building out the workflow or the workflows that I've built out for code development, um, I broke it down just like a software engineering team. So going back to my point, treat them, treat them like human employees as well. So you have multiple agents. You, you have a planner agent. You have a PM agent. You have a software developer agent. You have a tester agent, a dev agent, whatever. And when the initial question comes in, when you ask your initial question, the, the planner agent takes it and breaks it down into chunks. And this is how we want to organize it. This is how we want to break it down. Has the, the developer actually put some code together? If it doesn't work or they can't put it together that way, circle back up to the PM and say, yeah, we can't do that. Give me another option. And so instead of taking a one-shot approach, you break it down into a workflow that allows it to repeat itself until it finds the right solution. That's how I approach that. I, I use a tool called, well, there's a website, cursor.directory, which is just a list of like pretext contexts. And it'll be like, you are an expert level engineer, front engineer, you know, you and Next.js and whatever, and I just list that, and then I write my contacts. And if there are technologies that I'm using that aren't there, I'll go to my find Python one and go into ChatGPT and be like, I have this context, but I want to do it with other technologies, rewrite it for me, and then I have another one, and I fix that. And um, I have, it's like a I have seen people tell the prompt to like, ask questions and um, like obtain consensus before moving on. I don't do that as much, but like that's a good question to ask and ask people to do that. Another thing to, to pinpoint in on, on one specific response is to actually give it positive and negative examples. So examples actually help AI engines a lot or LLMs, so that's a good way to go about it. Problem is, is if you're talking more complex stuff, like larger bits of code, you know, you can start, you need to start getting considerate of your context window. So I, I want to keep this conversation going. I, I do want to make sure we can get Sora on and show his perplexity clone. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for, for sharing your insights, for sharing knowledge, and continue the conversation. So, uh, yeah, he's on Discord, I'm going to try to get him in, and uh, this is a grand experiment here. So bear with us. Okay. Hello. Hi, Art. Hey, Rock, we hear Sora? Hello. Yep. Okay, cool. Why don't you go ahead, sir? I'm sure what you're doing. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm going to just give a quick brief introduction about myself. So, I'm the co-founder of Trusty Reporter. Uh, we're an AI for business intelligence tool, and we've been using LangChain to build our entire stack. Now, being that being said, jump into the perplexity clone. So, this is like a quick demo of what the perplexity clone actually looks like. Uh, this is like with the front end and an uh, API deployed with Laxer. So I'll just quickly show you guys like a quick demo of how it works. You know what are the things that you can do with it. So for example, if I ask it, give me give me a run of the major developments. Open AI dev day 2024, and I give it a minute. So it will basically go through the web, search everything, and be able to give me an answer. So it, it takes a bit longer than your regular complexity, but I think yeah, given we are trying to do this over and at minimum uh, server capacity, it does a pretty good job uh, there. So yeah, so you will get real-time API, fine-tuning, uh, prompt cache with model escalation, and these are the top six things that you basically got through anyways. So that that's a good demo. With the jumping on to how and everyone, this code is available on amf.org, so you can run through this uh, in a repo. Go ahead, Sora. To the authentication of the not See, this is like the basic setup here, so you can basically have, uh, you know, this is something which I will skip for now and move to the notebook, but here is where the main uh, crux of the matter lies, right? So the idea here is to basically start with a query generator, which is to basically say that uh, you give it a query, you then ask an element to basically uh, you know, give you four or five different versions of the same query. Uh, from there, you basically go to DuckDuckGo search, and you use DuckDuckGo search to basically search for results across all of those three to four queries. Now the power of this tool is that I'm not using uh, Tavoli or Surfer API here. I'm using the proper DuckDuckGo library to basically get results. And from there, I'm basically having a web scraper agent that then goes through each of those results and web pages. 
tries to generate summaries in context of the question that you ended up asking and then finally uh, compiling the generated summaries into a final result and then giving you the final answer, right? So if I set this up, then this is the utils for uh, DuckDuckGo. Uh, this is like the DuckDuckGo library basically gives you this ASN DDGS which you suppose that you can just set up your so yeah, the overall state you have your search query class, this is where you end up generating multiple query, then you have you search for those queries in the next node, which is your search results node. This is the like state mode where you then end up going uh, through each of these pages and basically downloading them. Once you have the content from each of these pages, you simply you simply end up using the send function from Langra to basically generate them. So this is the generate summaries, which is which basically comes from continue to summary summarize notes. So you basically use the send function, which goes into the generate summary function, and then you basically have your final answer. So yeah, uh, this is what the graph looks like. The, also, I'm using the check pointer, like in memory check pointer, here, which basically does a very good job of just providing context. If I say I want to create a quick, you know, quick start guide for Langra. You can then go ahead and just again just run this particular node. I think there has been a particular change in the uh, in launching in the launching library because of which you will now have to use import nest IO or uh, nest async IO to basically run this particular set. So I'm, I will make the change as well. Uh, yeah, and then you just have your output here and you can basically end up giving the result. So this gives you like a complete so we are for a quick start by so it was able to all the you know completely get you started with launching and that is essentially what this does. Hope this was helpful and people are able to follow and the experiment was successful for you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much and thanks everyone for working with us to deal with the remote remote connections issues. I'll ask that for questions. Uh, we don't have a back microphone that's working well here. I can read Re relay them. Uh, what questions do we have about Sorok's Flexity clone project? Why? Why don't that go over? Was it Tali or what was the other one? Yeah, so uh, Jackson was asking, you know, why did you choose DuckDuckGo over a Tavoli or, or others? So, uh, I think with Tavoli or Surfer API, you only get 200 free requests and then you have to start going on a date map. But the code for this, you can basically use it for free as long as you do not get like, uh, uh, limit uh, and if you're basically just getting the top three or four searches uh, and basically you know using that first mode where you're generating multiple multiple search queries and then getting two to three searches per search query you're basically getting a total of 10 search queries and you're still getting the same end of result so you can do this basically for free as compared to even in production as compared to doing it uh, in for a service like that. And you also get the advantage of being kept in the completely private uh, search engine. So, yeah. Yes. If I remember correctly from one of our office hours discussions, I think Sir Robin does a comparison test on his version versus the real version. I want to echo back the question that Rob asked. So, so Rob mentioned that on one of our office hours, you had shown a side-by-side -side comparison of your Perplexity Notebook tool versus the Perplexity Out Outlook uh, uh, Perplexity commercial project. Uh, can you kind of summarize what your findings were for that? Sure. So, if we, this was, so on the 4th of August, is when I did this comparison and the date is very specific because uh, the Olympics were basically going on at that time mm -hmm. and uh, I just wanted to uh, you know get just understand what were India's medal uh, medal at that part of time and I searched it on the puppetry version of perplexity it gave me that India had zero results uh, zero medals in the Olympics at that point of time which was uh, incorrect India had like three medals at that point of time so. Uh, you know, and whereas when I ended up using the perplexity clone that I ended up building, uh, that will give you the correct result, which is uh, India had things. So the difference was essentially if I use the the free version of perplexity, a lot of times it will hallucinate because I'm guessing it's not really searching through the web as deeply as you would want it to. Which is again given that it is for free, it's probably not 
uh, using the server API or tabulate for search, and it's probably using like a free version of uh, something to do it. Uh, but yeah, if you if you use something like Tagalog and you are able to search through the web, uh, you know, get all of these web pages, you have much better. Uh, but when you go to Perplexity Pro, I think the results are very comparable between Perplex the Perplexity clone that I just showed you versus what Perplexity. So, thanks for sharing that. What is next in your exploration of these technologies? Like, you, you've learned how to build a internet search agent, you've shared that. It's in a repo, it's on AMA.org. AMA you can click down in the October meeting, there's a link to the notebook itself so you can run through it. Uh, I think the one learning for us for this entire journey has been you cannot look at all of these tools in isolation. So, like, looking at just Langraph and isolation and that's just one framework that is going to solve all your problems, combining it with existing software development models and uh, you know, pairing land up and matching with it is a really powerful way of just building systems in a really fast, really quick, and being able to get a bit over it. And I think the biggest uh, you know, advantage that we feel is just being able to switch LMs and switch nodes very easily and just uh, you know, chain them together and nest them together. Is super easy with that to manage. So yeah, that's that's very handy. Cool. Thank you so much, Sora. I appreciate your patience as we deal with the inner AV systems figured out and moving into this new home. And I appreciate each and every one of you for participating. I'll ask you if you have a microphone in your hand or you have a, a lap mic clipped on your clipped on your shirt. We can bring back to that back uh, the back back table there. And let me see. Two two Wednesdays from now, we're hanging out. I think it's skinny. So if you want to grab our beer, do have a little hacky hour, hacking in the labs. And thank you so much for showing up and be part of the community. Thank you.